Bruchim Abayim, to the 10th and what will be the final shield, the final lecture in the series of Shi'urim, the lectures on Rabbi Salavechek, Rabbi Shabel's Emergence of Ethical Man. In the first nine lectures, we covered the basic themes and topics of the book. And we saw how Rabbi Salavechek has presented to us what, in fact, actually to most people, um, who seem to be a very novel understanding of not only of the of the scriptures of the Chumash, the Bible, but in addition to of um, Jewish philosophy and um, Jewish theology. Rabbi Soloveitchik has actually taken traditional Jewish theology as gleaned from verses and perhaps from Chazal, and what he's done is he's expressed it in what would um, could characterize purely naturalistic terms. So even such fundamental concepts and principles of faith, such as Tchias HaMesim, the resurrection of the dead, or Nisim, which are miracles, Rabbi Soloveitchik explains in pure naturalistic terms and to use his own words without any recourse to metaphysics, and certainly not to metaphysical language. Um, the thrust of the book, its philosophical perspective, is that of man as a being who has emerged um, as part of an evolutionary process to layers of what you would call an ethical existence. And therefore, Arisola Vechik actually shows that the Chumash, in fact, outlines, details and outlines man's ascent to what you would call the pinnacle of ethics, which is the revelation at Sinai, and there a relationship between a Kodesh Baruch Hu, between God and the Jewish people is established on what was eventually going to say to be novel ethical foundations, namely the dual role of God as both as a reigning king and also as a king who regards men as in fact comrades. So in fact, what we saw in, um, in The Emergence of Ethical Man is a rendering of man as the product of what you call a natural evolution of not only biology, but also of ethics. And um, as we saw actually in the last lecture, this um, is not only a concept which pervades the Chumash, but that actually this is in fact a notion which actually details and defines the very linguistic and ter- the linguistic nature of the biblical um, scripture. We saw last week, in fact, actually, that the, the structure of the language of the Chumash um, represents a new understanding of man, not only as purely subservient to a reigning and autocratic king, but as the Jewish people being addressed as in an ethical terms, and a personal and ethical relationship between man and God. So, the question which we have to really ask in summary of everything we've said is that, very simply, one could ask, what are we to make of this? Rizal Levechik seems to have cast what we've seen, what we have heretofore understood to be fundamental metaphysical concepts and principles of Jewish theology, um, not to speak, I mean, um, without, without saying principles of faith, which Maimonides has, in fact, um, has set forth as the, the minimum of what a Jew is supposed to believe, and placed it actually within a very, very naturalistic anthropological setting. So if this is true, one could, in fact, raise the question, where is the, 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 um, where is the domain where is the dimension of spirituality? Have we purely reduced man to a natural, ethical being? Or is there a dimension of spirituality, is there a dimension of metaphysics that's left of the biblical revelation of the Chumash and therefore of Jewish belief? This is the very basic question that has to be asked. Um, if, in fact, we've reduced man to a purely naturalistic, ethical being, Allah the philosophy of Henry Bergson, as we've seen, who was such a very important influence on the Rev's philosophy, then in fact, 
Judaism, in a certain sense, ceases to be what you would call a spiritual belief, ceases to be, um, seems to be of empty, the spiritual content of metaphysics. There is nothing transcendent. Everything is imminent. And therefore, what sets Judaism apart from any area or study of anthropology and evolution, save for its legal aspect, which one could always argue, if immanento is in fact, in a certain sense, man-made too, chas v'shalom. So this is the issue that I'd like to address now, because I think that after reading the book, one could get the impression, and many people have gotten the impression, that in fact actually Rabbi Soloveitchik has stripped Judaism of its metaphysics, of its spirituality, and reduced it to, in a certain sense, a, um, a subcategory of religious anthropology and philosophy. Now, when I began these lectures, I mentioned that there were two sets of lectures that were given to me a number of years ago. One set of lectures, which I called the Blau's lecture, Blau lectures, are lectures on Genesis, and the other set of lectures, which I called the Hamnic lectures, which are which I entitled a philosophy of Judaism. I also mentioned that there seemed to have been a um, an interface between the two lectures, because the last two lectures on Genesis corresponded to the opening chapters of the lectures of Jewish philosophy and of Emergence of Ethical Man. Emergence of Ethical Man is in fact very, very much a book um, version of these lectures that were delivered orally at Bernard Revel Graduate School. But one could clearly see that the lectures of Genesis um, which deal with the creation of the world, first from an irrationalistic, Romandian perspective, and then afterwards to a Kabbalistic perspective, were actually, in a certain sense, a, um, an introduction or prolegemna to the lectures on philosophy which cast man within this naturalist setting. And the fact that the lectures of Genesis end with two chapters, which constitute the very first chapters of Merge of Ethical Man, seems to indicate that, in fact, the two sets of lectures are not two separate, mutually uh, distinct um, topics and courses, but actually, for a Soloveitcher, constituted two parts of one whole, right? Shnaim Shehem Echad. Namely, the metaphysical understanding of creation, as it in fact goes the the um, Kabbalistic, particularly the Kabbalistic understanding of creation, of reality, as it goes beyond the rationalism of the Rambam, of Maimonides, and the medieval philosophers, and the philosophy of Judaism, which projects us back to a very naturalistic interpretation, both of scripture and understanding of man and his relationship to a Kaddish Baruch, to God. And the question is, this appears to me to be what I would say was is the what I would call the problem of having published *Emergence of Ethical Man* as a book in and of itself. One gets the impression that a Rosalvejic sat down to cast Judaism in anthropological, naturalistic terms, when in fact, in my opinion, the book *Emergence of Ethical Man* is actually originally part of a larger work, which encompasses both the Kabbalistic lectures on Genesis and also to the naturalistic setting and philosophy of the lectures on philosophy, which, as I said in book form, represent the emergence of ethical man. What, in fact, therefore, can we say about Rabbi Soloveitchik's philosophy and the vision of Judaism and of Torah, of Scripture, and of the Halacha, which he, proje- which he projects, given this, um, the unity of these two halves, of these two parts of one whole. Now, as is known, and I think I mentioned this in one of the lectures, the Tzaddik, in um, several places, makes a very strong connection between what we would say Kabbalah and also between Greek philosophy. For example, in the Kutei Ma'amorim, in the standard version on Hamad Aleph, the Tzaddik says that the entire Chachva of Rav Shimba Yochai in the Sefer Zayra was known by what the, the, the Sabe Atuna, the, 
the elders, the wise people of Athens, which the Gemara speaks about in Mesachas um, Bechayos. And in fact, actually, the um, Greek philosophy, Greek natural philosophy, is a type of a garment, a lavush, um, for, in fact, the secrets and the ideas of the Kabbalah. He repeats this in other places too, Bach Shevus Charutz, Dav Chafam and Aleph, Likutim Ma'amorim, Dav Mbezim and Aleph. The Pesadik's understanding is, is that Greek philosophy is to be considered what we call a chitzonius, an outer garment, the panemius, the inner essence of which is um, the um, Sisra Kabbalah, the secrets of the Kabbalah. Meaning is that what I understand that I want to actually expound upon Ripsodic's remarks, that in fact one can understand Kabbalah, of course, as certainly as Rabbi Soloveitchik, um, portrays it in the lectures of Genesis, the um, the Ilan HaKadosh, the emergence, the revelation of the worlds, is in fact not only something which is a, a static hierarchy, but in fact actually is a process. Rabbi Soloveitchik, for example, in his description in the lectures on Genesis of the Shabbos, of the Sabbath, speaks about the um, the three meals, the three suttas of the Shabbos as representing different stages in Kabbalistic revelation. Um, and the theme, really the theme is the dichotomy between what he calls ontology and ethics, um, determinism versus human free will. Um, Rabbi Salvejic understands that the theme of the Shabbos, which um, supposedly ends in a, the final highest world, which is the world of Arich, the highest worlds of unity, represents the historical movement which takes the two movements, the two aspects of ontology and ethics, scientific determinism versus um, human free will and the ethical relationship with God as being two parallel roads, but not parallel in a Euclidean sense, but perhaps in a more Riemannian sense, but these two roads actually eventually converge at the end of history. At the end of history, there will be a merger of ontology and ethics. Now, we remarked, actually, um, I marked actually in one or two of the lectures, that this also seems to be an underlying theme of Rabbi Soloveitchik too. The merger of ontology and ethics, the merger of naturalism and ethics, is a theme which repeats itself in different Gilgulim, in... Um, um, different expressions um, within the entire work. So the fact is, is that it's clear from understanding the two works in perspective one to another, that in fact Rabbi Soloveitchik, right, would have probably said that um, that the historical evolution of naturalism and even natural ethics is Perhaps really, in fact, the chitzoni is the garment of an inner spiritual movement which reaches towards the worlds of unity, where in fact ontology and ethics are in fact merged on a Kabbalistic, on a metaphysical level. So we have in fact actually two movements, each or two roads, two power roads, two lanes, each of them containing their own different type of dichotomy um, in the... Um, the, um, we have a natural versus ethical lane, and then we have a metaphysical, which is actually scientific versus um, spiritual. And in fact, these two lanes, well, actually these two roads, each of which is two lanes, in other words, one road has two lanes. One is natural biological, biological evolution and ethical evolution, and the second road also has two lanes, which means um, ontology and metaphysics, determinism and spirituality, and Kabbalah. And in fact, actually, there's a submerger in each of these two roads. And eventually, Rabbi Soloveitchik's understanding is, is that what we see as merger in the naturalist ethical lane is reflective, or is perhaps to be understood as the outer garment of the inner garment, which on a spiritual level merges science, ontology, with spirituality, with metaphysics, and that's in the what you would call the Kabbalistic lane.
So, in other words, basically, right, we see here the Rabbi Soloveitchik's overarching theme is, is that by understanding the scriptures within a contemporary scientific perspective, and when I say contemporary, I mean contemporary in every sense of the word, where Soloveitchik not only draws upon evolutionary theory and theories of psychology and biological theories, vitalism, etc., but Soloveitchik also, in fact, draws upon archaeology. He even, in fact, draws, rubs shoulders a little bit with biblical criticism. All of this as part of what you would call scientific methodology. And then, in fact, through an understanding of the verses, through understanding of the scriptures, which, of course, Babel Shlema, he understands to be the Devar Hashem, right, as revealed through Meshach Rabbeinu, then one is able to achieve a vision which, in a certain sense, represents what you would call the outer garment, the more physical garment, of a spiritual process, of which he discusses in the first series of lectures, but leaves it to our imagination and only alludes to it when saying that in this work he's not going to deal with metaphysics nor with metaphysical ideas. So, we have a very, very interesting um, approach and understanding perspective of emergence if we see it within the overarching perspective and conceptual scheme of the two works as such. Now, this in fact actually is an important point because one is tempted, one is tempted to say that the emergence of ethical man should be understood perhaps as a a different, a, a, a newer edition or a newer version of what we see in the Rambam, in Maimonides, in the Magnavuch and the Garf the Perplex. There, the Rambam, in fact, makes, u- makes use of Aristotelian interpretations of verse, of scripture, of psukit, in fact, to establish Jewish philosophy. And in certain cases, the Rambam, in fact, even uses that to take issue with Chazal. That's, for example, the Tamei Mitzvahs, etc., etc., if you take a look at, listen to the hashkafacircle.com shiurim on the um, on the Marinavuchim this um, this usage of the Rambam of combining a Aristotelian interpretation of verse actually is a major tool and theme in the guide. So for sure, this is something which Rabbi Salavich accomplishes in the marriage of the Khmer. This of course um, has precedent um, not only in the Rambam, but also in medieval Jewish philosophy. Um, the Chavis Alavavos, in his introduction, um, says that in matters of Hashkafa, one does not actually have to submit to Sanhedrin, but rather one could rely upon what he calls tradition, Messira, and Seichel, and intellect. What he means by tradition and intellect is not necessarily so clear, but Rabbi Soloveitchik would certainly say if he was speaking, that intellect represents the scientific understanding of the world, and tradition certainly would include the scriptures, the Chumash. So therefore, a modern scientific interpretation of the scriptures actually combines what the Chumash Olavavos calls intellect and tradition, and in so doing, represents a bona fide Jewish philosophy. However, one cannot deny the fact that after the revelations of the Kabbalah, the Gili of the Ari, in the um, 16th century, then for sure, to go back to medieval um, Jewish philosophy would in fact ignore and perhaps even undermine the entire thrust of Jewish thought, of Makshava, as in fact is, has been expressed for the last four or five hundred years. And Rabbi Soloveitchik, is certainly not one to um, is certainly one who would certainly acknowledge this, as is clear from everything else he says in all his different works, and certainly in the lectures of Kabbalah, and lectures on Genesis, which I spoke about, where Soloveitchik actually, in fact, I wouldn't say criticizes, but in fact, actually, in different places, adds a critique of the Rambam. But in fact, Kabbalah represents what you would call much more of an authentic Jewish philosophy, given the fact that. Rabbi Soloveitchik understands that Kabbalah represents a more authentic Jewish philosophy. How could it be that in the emerging ethical man he reduces things to very naturalistic, rationalistic um, interpretations, ignoring the metaphysical 
processes and aspects and concepts which are at the core of Jewish thinking? The answer is that Rabbi Soloveitchik, in my opinion, understands that Jewish philosophy is an overarching union of what are these two separate roads, which we might pursue them independently, but at the very, very end, like Riemannian parallel lines, they exist in non-Euclidean space. Namely, that one can pursue the Bible, one can pursue the Chumash, in terms of modern scientific understanding, archaeological understanding, even, I wouldn't say chas v'sholem, biblical criticism, but the techniques that are used by um, those who study the Chumash in understanding the structure of the language as, in fact, um, it was spoken at that time, and with the full knowledge that the interpretation thereof of the Chumash ultimately, right, since one is pursuing the truth, one is pursuing what one perceives to be the emes, the real truth, this um, will be none other than the outer garment which is revealed by the revelations of the spiritual worlds of the Kabbalah, which lends itself to a metaphysical understanding of these same natural concepts in terms of spiritual worlds. So I think really the book, Emergence of Ethical Man, to be properly understood, right, has to be understood in conjunction with Rabbi Soloveitchik's Kabbalistic understanding of creation, which awaits to still be published in um, the lectures of Genesis, the Blau lectures, and Mitzvah maybe one day we'll try to have that published too, and therefore the two books can be actually published together, and one could see this incredibly overarching vision of Rabban Shah Yisrael, of Yeshav Ben Now, I mentioned in a few places, which I think is important, is that there are actually very interesting points of connection between Rabbi Soloveitchik and Rav Kook. Um, for example, regarding the influence of Bergson and the vitalism of nature, which is a source of, um, of understanding the, um, the nature of the physical world and how it relates to man spiritually. Um, in addition to that, we find actually in the Shmona Kavatim of Cook, that means the lectures or the notebooks of Cook that were published posthumously, that were actually, actually published last year, a few years ago. And there also, in addition to the vitalism which Rav Cook saw within nature, um, there are actually sections of that work. I'm not going to actually read a few now. I'm going to, maybe we'll save that for another series of lectures on ShkofaCircle.com. There actually, it's very interesting that in one or two of the pieces, Rav Cook actually presents a theory of Tchias Amesim, of the resurrection of the dead, um, as being a type of a historical influence, a transgenerational historical influence um, and mark across generations, which is very, very similar to that to which Rabbi Soloveitchik presented in um, The Emergence of Ethical Man. My inkling is, is that actually we have Shnei Nevi'im, two prophets, that are being misnabe, even though there's two signoinim with two different styles. Nonetheless, it seems to be that they're being mechav and they're coming to actually um, they're coming to actually the same type of conclusions. That natural, that science, that modern science, right, can be incorporated within an overarching view of Jewish spirituality, which not only does not represent any type of an inherent contradiction to the inherent metaphysical and spiritual vision of Judaism, but rather, in fact, represents um, a physical dimension, which is part and parcel of it. Um, it's interesting how these two thinkers, what would think, really don't have really very much in common. Rabbi Sodov, Rabbi of Cook is really understood, really, people think of him as more of a, a mystic, even though he was quite a well-read mystic, or sort of a chick, the, um, the, the, um, the pinnacle of rationalism, right? And um, we speak, I mean, we spoke about how Man Cohen and Kant as being major influences, or so vicious thinking, um, not very, very far philosophically afield from the, um, the thought of Abchaim Soloveitchik, his grandfather, Abchaim Voloshin, we spoke about all these influences. Um, the fact is, is that we see that we have two individuals, two G'dayli Yisrael, 
who in their philosophy of Judaism are able to incorporate a wide range of contemporary and modern thinking and were able to use it not only in terms of apologetics but actually to actively use it as part and parcel of their spiritual vision which they understood to be the vision and perception in which the Torah looks both at the world, both at the Kodesh Baruch and both at mankind. So we've, there are very interesting parallels between them, which brings me to perhaps a, another conjecture to make, is that we see that if a person would in fact actually um, look at the course of Jewish philosophy in a general sense, the, um, if we understand that, let's say, what we call, quote-unquote, standard Jewish philosophy begins with the medieval rationalists, I mean, the, probably the first work of philosophy one could think of as being a work of philosophy, strictly speaking, is of Sadja Goin, which is the, begins the medieval Jewish philosophers. And the medieval Jewish philosophers, right, of course, first and foremost, the Ramah Maimonides, actually incorporated a very, very, contemporary Aristotelian approach, right, in their understanding both of the Torah, of Psukim, and of Chazal. Um, in the 16th century, with the emergence of the Kabbalah, of the Yari, we see that, in a certain sense, a good part of Jewish philosophy, in fact, immunizes itself from secular thinking, and um, the Yari basically brings Jewish philosophy within to itself, independent of the, um, the contemporary scientific view of the world at the time, but rather deals with what, what we call purely spiritual and metaphysical concepts. Um, if a person looks not only at the Yari, but the Balatanya, the Nefeshachayim, right? And even the Groa, one does not sense that modern science is playing a role in interpretation and in a, the Jewish perspective, spiritual perspective, which these thinkers are taking um, on, the, um, on the Torah and its relationship to the world. So in other words, it's an interesting thing is that we could perhaps understand the medieval Jewish philosophers as even though they combine um, psukim, scripture, chazal, with science, basically medieval Jewish philosophers we could understand to be somehow ontologically inclined. In other words, a, um, a view of Judaism which is completely commensurable with contemporary science at that time was Aristotelian theory, or Plato, or Greek philosophy. The, um, the anti-ontological, the ethical, the spiritual, would in fact actually be related to the hundreds of years after that, with the revelation of the Ari, where Jewish philosophy is really concerned with the interpretation of the Zaya and the interpretation of the concepts of the Kabbalah. Um, the, um, there is very little, if not any, um, attempt to make any type of union with contemporary science. And the works, even of the Ramchal, and the Chaim Voloshana, and the Balatanya, are concerned purely with interpretation of the Ari's metaphysics. So we have over here, in a certain sense, Jewish philosophy itself imitating, or itself, namely that we have a movement of an ontology which characterizes the medieval philosophers, and we have a movement of what's called spirituality and ethics, spirituality-ethics, which characterizes the, um, the later philosophers, what's called the modern philosophers, who are really concerned with understanding Torah and mitzvahs in Kabbalistic senses, okay? Of course, I might be leaving out people like Jewish first, etc., etc., but I'm speaking about the mainstay of Jewish philosophy. It would seem that the 20th century brings about this somehow mergence, the merger of ontology and ethics, of scientific determinism, and Kabbalistic spirituality in the philosophies of Rabban Shei Yisrael, of Yosef Eselevechik, and Haraya Kuk, Zechat Salim Yifrocha, both thinkers who are, of course, familiar with contemporary science, contemporary thought, and also familiar 
with not only Jewish philosophical, rational concepts, but also familiar with the Kabbalah, are seeking to create this merger of ontology and ethics. In other words, life imitates art here. Life imitates philosophy. Jewish philosophy itself, which seeks to merge the ontological and ethical, it itself is part of a philosophical movement, which in fact, um, through the process, through the history of ideas in Jewish philosophy, it felt expresses itself as a historical merger of philosophical, philosophically oriented ontology and philosophically oriented ethics and spirituality. So the crescendo, I wouldn't say the end, but this merger of Jewish philosophy, of Jewish thinking, in my opinion, is represented really very, very well with these two 20th century figures who, in fact, in the philosophies, try to offer an overreaching, an overarching view of Jewish thinking, which straddles both the naturalistic and scientific worlds of contemporary science and philosophy, together with the traditional Kabbalistic view of the world as being expression of an inner metaphysics which constitutes the panemius, the spiritual essence of this scientific um, scientificism. So with this, we could really see that, in fact, the emergence of Ethel Mann represents, in a certain sense, a watershed in Jewish philosophy. Um, of course, the story doesn't end here, because the challenges of, um, it's very, very interesting, the, the 20th century uh, represented the challenges of what you call science, scientific determinism, naturalism, evolution, as being a very, very important challenge for traditional, fundamental Jewish beliefs. Rabbi Soloveitchik touches upon, a little bit upon archaeology, um, a little bit upon what's called biblical criticism. However, my understanding is, is that the archaeology with which Rabbi Yosheb Soloveitchik had to contend with was, as certainly as he expresses it in the emergence of ethical man, is largely supportive of a lot of his theses, and there isn't major conflict and controversy that he has to deal with. Um, there is a Kenite theory of biblical criticism, which he easily um, does away with. However, um, 40, 50 years, 60 years after this, we see that the major challenge of both archaeology and biblical criticism, as well as the scientific challenges of brain science, etc., actually create new challenges and very, very severe challenges um, to um, a true understanding of Torah thought and a Torah hashkafa and machshava. Um, most people um, tend to um, cocoon themselves and to ostracize them, uh, to become ostriches and put their heads underneath the sand and, you know, Shalom Ha Yisrael. But, of course, um, those of you who feel that sometimes these challenges have to be met on, straight on, and one has to deal with the realities of scientificism, both um, scientifically, archaeologically, and in terms of biblical science, then in fact, I'm not going to give any answers in this lecture, but Rabbi Soloveitchik, Rabbi Soloveitchik's emergence of ethical man could serve as an inspiration that one can be a contemporary thinking person and also a very, very devout religious um, Jew. So with this, I think we're going to end the lectures of the emergence of ethical man. Um, we can go on. I think that what I would recommend, those of you who have not read the book, you should read the book. And of course, I'd be very, very willing to hear your comments, intelligent comments and criticisms if you take contention of any of my interpretations. But certainly, the emergence of ethical man, in my opinion, is a must reading for anyone who really wants to look at how a Godel Batera and a person who is thoroughly conversant with modern science and modern thought
um, merges this and creates a Weltanschauung, a Hashkafer, a philosophy of Judaism, in which he can remain um, true to the Torah and true to the belief of his forefathers. From an undisclosed location in Yerushalayim, Yerach Kodesh, be well and cultivate.